Okay, work energy theorem or conservation of energy? Conservation of energy. Not given force, not given distance, no mention of work, and there's no change in the mechanical energy of the uh, car. Right? It's going to have the same amount of mechanical energy the moment it drives off the cliff as it smashes into the ground, not water, below. Not that it matters at that distance. Okay. Um, so what we have okay, in this situation, and the trick to this was that initially it does have um, potential energy because we're actually asked to calculate the height of the cliff, which is the initial height. That's where the car was at the beginning of the question. Right? We know that it drives off the cliff at 25 meters per second. Okay? And then it's you know, going to do this and crash into the ground. Okay? Now, oh, what happened? Okay, it's going to crash into the ground down here. Right? Here, it's going to be moving at 53 meters per second. What do I need to get from the context of this question about my final position for this car? What does it not have? Um, the ground is zero, so your final um, final height would be zero. Right. My final height and thus my final potential energy are zero in this situation. Okay, because I can't fall any further. Okay, than the ground. You hit the ground and that's it. You don't fall any further than that. So what I have to recognize is, yep, it's a law of conservation of energy question. Okay, and I'm going to follow the pattern, same as I always do. Initial potential plus initial kinetic equals final potential plus final kinetic. But I have to recognize that because my final height is zero meters, my final potential energy is zero. Okay, that is the trick to this question. It's not a difficult trick. It's just something we have to get from the question and understand, oh, I'm missing a number. Actually, I'm not missing a number. It's just zero. Okay. All right, so I'm trying to find out how high the cliff is, which would be part of initial potential energy. I want to get that by itself. What should I move? The initial kinetic, yeah. How would I move the initial kinetic over? Subtract it. Subtract it over. Okay. So we're going to have... Initial potential equals final kinetic minus initial kinetic. Okay, are we still following the same pattern? But it looks a little bit different because this time we're missing one of the forms of energy. Okay. All right. Then I put in my formulas: m times g times h initial equals one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. Okay, so I'm trying to find HI. What can I do with all the M's right now? Cross them off. I can cross them off, which is good because they didn't tell me the mass of the car. Okay? Not that it matters. Okay. Cool. okay. So now I want to get HI by itself. What do I do with G? Divide, Divide it over the other side. Right? Okay. When you guys first started these questions, this algebra was intimidating. Okay. And if it wasn't, good. I'm glad it wasn't ever intimidating. But, okay. um, all right, so now we're solving for HI. So we just have to plug in our numbers here. So 1 half times 53 squared minus 1 half times uh, 25 squared okay. divided by 9.81 will give us the height of the cliff. Okay, so that cliff was 79.4 meters high. I wouldn't want to fall off that cliff. That's a long way. Okay, everybody all right with that one? Okay, how are we feeling about this conservation of energy stuff? Okay, we're starting to get the hang of it. Okay. The big thing here, guys, and it's going to be big on your unit exam, is just being able to recognize the question and then follow the pattern. Okay, if you 
follow the pattern, you can pick out the details that you need to pick out. That's why we kind of prescribe the pattern that we keep showing you, okay? Just so that you can go, okay, here's what I do next. Now I can look at the context of the question and go, oh, I don't have that or I have this, okay? And then you can move on to the next step and the next step, okay? All right, um, your labs, your work labs are marked, okay? I have not returned them yet, but the marks are in PowerSchool, okay? Um, they were generally pretty well done, okay? Um, but I'm gonna wait to go over them until tomorrow, okay? I mean, you did after all, just hand them in this morning, okay? But um, I will go over those in more detail tomorrow. Um, today, I just wanna finish up conservation of energy. I don't think we need a day more than today. Okay, I think tomorrow we can look at efficiency, which is a pretty short lesson, and do a unit exam review on Monday. Okay, and then be done this unit, and that will mean that on Tuesday, we will start the last unit. And then Wednesday will be your test. Okay, so that's kind of the plan going forward. Okay. Um, I posted the unit exam review package, okay, so you can check it out on Google Classroom. Uh, so make sure you do that probably over the weekend. Um, and then that way when we do our unit exam review on Monday, you have some questions to ask or sample questions you'd like me to go over or things like that. Okay, that makes the review a bit more effective for you. Um, but make sure you're having a look at that. Okay, now coming up on the end of the year here. Okay, like we are three weeks out okay, from the end of the year. So uh, my suggestion would be that you start having a look over your other units. I don't mean you have to spend an hour every night for the next three weeks looking that over, far from it, okay? I would say your first step is find your stuff from the other three units, okay? Get it a little bit organized, right? Start looking at maybe some of the worksheets or something like that. A good idea is to you know, you know, go through the digital workbook and just try a couple of questions here or there. Okay, like, you know, for example, tonight you could look at one of the naming worksheets, try five naming questions at random. You have the keys after all there in Google Classroom as well. Okay, and just see, oh, I still know how to do this? Cool, okay, then I probably don't need to review naming a whole bunch if I got all, all five that I picked at random right. Okay, do some naming, do some uh, writing formulas. But you don't have to spend hours. Okay, just kind of pick away at it a little bit each day for the next three weeks and then you'll have a good idea of what you really need to focus on when crunch time comes, okay? And it's a lot less intimidating than going, oh, my exam is two days from now and I haven't opened a book yet. Just the thought of that makes me anxious, okay? Um, so hopefully that's not going to be you, okay? But if you have a quick look over it, five minutes, 10 minutes here or there, okay, over the next little while, it, uh, it adds up in a hurry, right? We all get this idea, if I study for like eight hours, I'll be good. Well, if you study five or 10 minutes a day for the next three weeks, you'll study way more than eight hours, okay? And it helps a lot, okay? Rather than trying to cram eight hours in the night before, okay? It'll be way more effective to do it in little chunks here and there. So my suggestion is time management, okay? Plan it here or there a little bit over the next little while, okay? Um, in case you're wondering, your final exam is exactly the same format as your unit exams. It's just longer, okay? So there's some multiple choice. Right now, 50 multiple choice. And I think there's 12, 12 or 15. I'm getting my physics and science mixed up. It's 12 or 15 written, okay? It's exactly the same format as a unit exam, okay? So it's gonna look just like that. It's just gonna be longer because you got two hours to write it instead of 85 minutes. And I'll, I'll do a final exam review just like I do for every unit exam, okay, um, a little closer to the time. Okay? All right. Okay, let's try that one. Uh, and then we'll take a little break. Try that one, then we'll take a little break. Okay, so a skydiver jumps out of a plane moving at 90 meters per second. So that would be their initial speed, okay? Because that's when they jumped out of a perfectly good airplane, okay? And they are 10,000 meters above the ground. So that would be my initial height, 10,000 meters, 
Okay, how fast will the diver be falling when he is 8,000 meters above the ground? So that would be my final height. Okay, assuming he has not opened his parachute and there's no air resistance of any kind. Okay, so we're looking for the F. Okay. So, no mention of force, no mention of distance. This is a conservation of energy question. EI equals EF. Just like dropping a rock off of a cliff. Okay, you're just dropping a person out of a plane. That's the same deal. Well, not really, but you get the idea. Physically, it's the same thing. Sociologically, it's much different. All right, uh, so our initial, we've got initial potential because we're 10,000 meters off the ground. We also have initial kinetic because we're moving at 90 meters per second. Okay? At the end, we have potential because we're 8,000 meters above the ground. And they're asking us to calculate how fast they're going, so they definitely have some kinetic energy. Right? None of those are zero at this point. What I'm looking for is part of that term there. So I want to isolate that term by subtracting EP final over to the other side. So initial potential plus initial kinetic minus final potential will give me final kinetic. All right, now I can put in the formulas. Okay, so I can say M times G times H initial plus one half MV initial squared minus MGH final equals one half MV final squared. I was never told the mass of the skydiver and it is irrelevant for this question, so I'm going to cancel it off. Okay. I want VF by itself, what do I do with the half? Divide it, divide it over to the other side. Okay, and then I have to what? Square root. Okay, so when we're looking at this with the numbers plugged in, we have the square root of 9.81 times 10,000 plus 1 half times 90 squared minus 9.81 times 8,000, the final height, okay, divided by 1 half, all square rooted, will give us our final speed. Okay, so in our calculators, Okay, do it one piece at a time. 9.81 times 10,000. Okay, plus 0.5 times 90 squared. Minus 9.81 times 8, oh, I did it again, times 8,000. Okay, and now I'm going to divide that by one half. Then I'm going to square root that. Oh, I square root it twice. 217.5. So 218 meters per second would be how fast they are going after falling two kilometers. You go pretty fast falling two kilometers. It's a long time to fall. You'd have to like scream and then inhale and scream some more. All right, so 218 meters per second. Okay. All right, everybody all right with that? So it's the law of conservation of energy that makes a lot of these kind of everyday things work, okay? I don't know if anyone's ever watched or even participated in the soapbox derby that they have here in town. It's usually the end of June, okay, that they have that go on. Um, but that's conservation of energy, right? You carry your soapbox racer up to the top of the hill, okay? Usually it's Shell Hill or Veterans Hill, whatever they call it now, okay? And then um, you convert that potential energy into kinetic as you go down the hill. Now, is all the energy conserved in that situation? What does some of it get turned into? Do the racers make sound as they go down? You can hear the wheels spinning. You can hear the ground and the tires crunching. Okay? All that stuff. Sound is a form of energy. It's one of the main places where that mechanical energy is actually lost. Okay? There's also heat. Tires get hotter. All the moving parts have friction. Okay? Things like that. Right? But it's a prime example of conservation of energy, converting one form into another. That's why they're going so fast when they get to the bottom. Okay? All amusement park rides work on that same principle. 
and we do a bunch of work in towing it to the top of the first hill and then we let its mechanical energy do the rest. Okay? That's why there's never a second hill on the roller coaster as high as the first one. You'd never get back up. Okay? In the real world, you lose energy, so you'd never get back up the, the first hill again. Okay? If there was no friction, roller coasters would run forever. Okay? Once you towed it to the top of the first hill, it would never lose any energy. It would just constantly cycle. Okay? And it would just keep going and going. Which, I mean, that might be fun or not. Depends whether you're having fun or not. Okay? Or puking. We used to take the physics kids to West Edmonton Mall for a trip for uh, Physics 20. We don't do it anymore, but it's mostly because they've taken half the park down. Um, but yeah, we saw lots of mind bender vomit exhibits. Awesome. Okay, uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of a break here. Let's say five minutes or so, and then we're going to try something else here. When you do this, you actually get negative 16,800. Right? And that's okay. The force is negative. It's slowing it down. That means the force is acting against the car. Okay? It's pushing it the other way. Right? Your brakes actually exert a negative force on your car as well because that force is directed backwards. That's why your car slowed down. Right? So what we got here is that we know the mass, okay? 5,000 kilograms, and we know that the distance over which the snow drift acts is 50 meters and that the car hit the snow drift at 20 meters per second, and when it got out of the snow drift, was only going eight meters per second. Okay, we're looking for the average force exerted by the snow drift on the car in slowing it down. Okay, what kind of question is this? It's work energy theorem. Energy is changing in this question. We have less of it at the end than we had at the beginning. Energy is not conserved. It's being turned into other things. So in this question, the work being done is changing the kinetic energy of the car, very much like the first question on our quiz today. Okay? And so then we would have force times distance equals EK final minus EK initial. Neither one of those are zero, so I can't cancel either one of them off in this situation. So I'm going to have force times distance equals one half mvf squared minus one half mvi squared. Okay? And we're going to um, manipulate for force by dividing both sides by d. Okay? So when we do that, we got one half times 5,000 times um, 8 squared minus 1 half times 5,000 times 20 squared. There's where your negative value comes in. Our final is less than our initial, and we're dividing that by the length of the snow drift, which was 50 meters. When we do that, we should get 16,800 newtons negative, backwards. Okay? Everybody all right with that? And so if you got a negative number, you did it right. It was supposed to be negative. If you didn't, you got positive 16,800, it's because you switched the two speeds. All right, tomorrow, efficiency. Okay. Uh, Monday, unit exam review. Tuesday, lab. Wednesday, yes.